Jekyll and Hyde, Chapter 8, The Last Night. Now, this chapter takes place one week after the previous chapter, Incident at the Window. And in that chapter, you had Enfield and Utterson see Dr. Jekyll in his window. They're talking to him. And then something happened to him that made him run off that really freaked Utterson and Enfield out, but they didn't really talk about it. So this chapter, again, takes place one week after that. Mr. Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner when he was surprised to receive a visit from Poole. As a reminder, Poole is Jekyll's butler. Bless me, Poole, what brings you here? He cried, and then taking a second look at him. What ails you? He added. Is the doctor ill? Mr. Utterson, said the man, there is something wrong. Take a seat, and here's a glass of wine for you, said the lawyer. Now take your time and tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's way, sir, replied Poole, and how he shuts himself up. Well, he shut himself up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it, sir. I wish I may die if I like it. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week, returned Poole, doggedly disregarding the question, and I can bear it no more. The man's appearance amply bore out his words. His manner was altered for the worse, and except for the moment when he had first announced his terror, he had not once looked the lawyer in the face. Even now, he sat with a glass of wine untasted on his knee, and his eyes directed to a corner on the floor. I can bear it no more he repeated. Come, said the lawyer. I see you have some good reason, Poole. I see there is something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what that is. I think there's been foul play, said Poole hoarsely. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened and rather inclined to be irritated in consequence. What foul play? What does the man mean? I daren't say, sir, was the answer. But will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr. Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and great coat, but he observed with wonder the greatness of the relief that appeared upon the butler's face, and perhaps with no less than the wine was still untasted when he set it down to follow. So Mr. Poole shows up at Mr. Utterson's house, and he's freaking out, and he says, you know, I think there's been foul play. I think something has happened to Dr. Jekyll, and I'm scared. And so Utterson is going to travel with him to Dr. Jekyll's place. It was a wild, cold, seasonable night of March, with a pale moon lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her, and a flying rack of the most diaphanous and lawny texture. The wind made talking difficult and flecked the blood into the face. It seemed to have swept the streets unusually bare of passengers. Besides, for Mr. Utterson thought he had never seen that part of London so deserted. He could have wished it otherwise, never in his life had he been conscious of so sharp a wish to see and touch his fellow creatures. For struggle as he might, there was borne in upon his mind a crushing anticipation of calamity. The square, when they got there, was all full of wind and dust, and the thin trees in the garden were lashing themselves along the railing. Poole, who had kept all the way a pace or two ahead, now pulled up in the middle of the pavement, and in spite of the biting weather, took off his hat and mopped his brow with a red po pocket handkerchief. But for all the hurry of his coming, these were not the dews of exertion he wiped away, but the moisture of some strangling anguish, for his face was white and his voice, when he spoke, harsh and broken. So they travel to Jekyll's place, and this is one of those times where the weather really reflects the mood. Um, if you've ever heard the term like pathetic fallacy. So we have this like kind of crazy moody weather outside that's really reflecting like the craziness that's happening with this whole Jekyll situation and the freaking out of his servant, uh, Mr. Poole. Well, sir, he said, here we are and God grants there be nothing wrong. Amen, Poole, said the lawyer. Thereupon the servant knocked in a very guarded manner. The door was opened on the chain and a voice within asked, is that you, Poole? It's all right, said Poole. Open the door. The hall, when they entered it, was brightly lighted up. The fire was built high, and about the hearth the whole of the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering, and the cook, crying out, Bless God, it's Mr. Utterson, ran forward as if to take him in her arms. What, what, are you all here? said the lawyer peevishly. Very irregular, very unseemly. Your master will be far from pleased. They're all afraid, said Poole. So here we learn that it's not just Poole that is scared about what might have happened to Dr. Jekyll, but in fact it's all the servants that are concerned about his well-being. Blank silence followed, no one protesting. Only a maid lifted up her voice and now wept loudly. 
Hold your tongue, Poole said to her with a great ferocity of accent that testified to his own jangled nerves. And indeed, when the girl had so suddenly raised the note of her lamentation, they had all started and turned towards the inner door with faces of dreadful expectation. And now, continued the butler, addressing the knife boy, reach me a candle and we'll go through this at once. So in other words, like, let's get this job done. Like, let's figure out what's going on here with Dr. Jekyll. And then he begged Mr. Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. Now, sir, he said, you come as gently as you can. I want you to hear, but I don't want you to be heard. And see here, sir, if by any chance he was to ask you in, don't go. Mr. Utterson's nerves at this unlooked for termination gave a jerk that nearly threw him from his balance, but he recollected his courage and followed the butler into the laboratory building and through the surgical theater with its lumber of crates and bottles to the foot of the stair. Here Poole motioned him to stand on one side and listen, while he himself, setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. So they walk towards this room that has been closed off the last place they saw Dr. Jekyll, and Poole says, okay, Utterson, I want you to come up here with me, but I don't want the person inside this room to know you're here, so be very quiet and just listen. Mr. Utterson, sir, asking to see you, he called, and even as he did so, once more violently signed to the lawyer to give an ear. A voice answered from within, Tell him I can't see anyone, it said complainingly. Thank you, sir, said Poole with a note of something like triumph in his voice, and taking up his candle, he led Mr. Utterson back across the yard and into the great kitchen, where the fire was out and the beetles were leaping on the floor. Sir, he said, looking Mr. Utterson in the eyes, was that my master's voice? It seemed much changed, replied the lawyer, very pale, but giving look for look. Change? Well, yes, I think so, said the butler. Have I been twenty years in this man's house to be deceived about his voice? No, sir. Master's made away with. He was made away with eight days ago when we heard him cry out upon the name of God. And who's in there instead of him? And why it stays there is a thing that cries to heaven, Mr. Utterson. So he asked Mr. Utterson, like, hey, that voice that responded to me when I told him that you were here, like, did that sound like Dr. Jekyll to you? And Utterson says, not, not really, no, it didn't. And Poole, the butler, says, no, because it's not him. Poole tells Utterson, hey, I've worked for Dr. Jekyll for 20 years. I know what that guy's voice sounds like, and the person behind that door is not Dr. Jekyll. In fact, Poole says that Dr. Jekyll was made away with eight days ago. So apparently it has been eight days since like they've seen or heard Dr. Jekyll's voice. And so Poole thinks that whoever is behind that door has done something really bad, possibly even killed Dr. Jekyll. It's a very strange tale, Poole. This is rather a wild tale, my man, said Mr. Utterson, biting his finger. Suppose it were as you suppose, supposing Dr. Jekyll to have been, well, murdered, what could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. Well, Mr. Utterson, you are hardly a man to satisfy, but I'll do it yet, said Poole. All this last week, you must know him or it or whatever it is that lives in that cabinet, has been crying night and day for some sort of medicine and cannot get to his mind. It was sometimes his way, the master's that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it on the stair. We've had nothing else this week back nothing but papers and a closed door, and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when no one was looking. Well, sir, every day, I and twice and thrice in the same day, there have been orders and complaints, and I have been sent flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought the stuff back, there would be another paper telling me to return it, because it was not pure, and another order to a different firm. This drug is wanted bitter bad, sir, whatever for. So they haven't been communicating with this person behind the door in person, but rather through notes. And so this person will leave a note on the other side of the door telling the servants to go do something and they'll go do it and then leave it outside the door. And then when no one's watching, the person will open the door and grab whatever is outside of the door. And the number one thing this person has been leaving notes about is some sort of like drug, some sort of like chemical that this person behind the door really, really wants. And so they've been sending pool all around town to the different chemists, which you can think of it like a pharmacy, um, to try and find this drug, and Poole will bring it back from one chemist, and the person behind the door will write a note back saying, no, 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 
like this isn't the right stuff like there's something wrong with this one I need you to go get the same drug from a different chemist and this is happening over and over and over again so this person is looking for a particular drug have you any of these papers said Mr. Utterson Poole felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note which the lawyer bending near the, to the candle examined carefully its contents ran thus Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Messrs. Ma. He assures them that their last sample is impure and quite useless for his present purpose. In the year 1800 and something, Dr. Jekyll purchased a somewhat large quantity from Messrs. M. He now begs them to search with the most sedulous care, and should any of the same quality be left, to forward it to him at once. Expense is no consideration. The importance of this to Dr. J. can hardly be exaggerated. So far, the letter had run composedly enough, but here with a sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he had added, find me some of the old. This is a strange note, said Mr. Utterson, and then sharply, how do you have it open? The man at Ma's was mainly angry, sir, and he threw it back at me like so much dirt, returned Poole. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand, do you know, resumed the lawyer. I thought it looked like it, said the servant rather sulkily, and then with another voice. But what matters hand of right, he said, I've seen him. We have, uh, Poole has one of the notes that this person behind the door has been writing to the different chemists. And so he shows it to Mr. Utterson. And Mr. Utterson says, okay, well, yeah, this is a very strange note. Um, do you think this is the doctor's handwriting? And Poole says, I don't know. Like, it kind of looks like it, but it kind of doesn't. But Poole says, but more important than that is I've seen the person behind this door. Seen him, replied Mr. Utterson. Well, that's it, said Poole. It was this way. I came suddenly into the theater from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is, for the cabinet door was open, and there he was at the far end of the room, digging among the crates. He looked up when I came in, gave a kind of cry, and whipped upstairs into the cabinet. It was but for one minute, and I saw him, but the hair stood upon my head like quills. Sir, if that was my master, why is he a mask upon his face? If it was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I've served him a long time. And then the man paused and passed his hand over his face. These are very strange circumstances, said Mr. Utterson, but I think I begin to see daylight. Your master, Poole, is plainly seized with one of those maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. Hence, for aught I know, the alteration of his voice, hence the mask and the avoidance of his friends, hence his eagerness to find this drug, by means of which the poor soul retains some hope of ultimate recovery. God grant that he be not deceived. There is my explanation. It is sad enough, Poole, I, and appalling to consider, but it is plain and natural, hangs well together, and delivers us from all exorbitant alarms. So Poole describes this guy. Um, he says he saw him one time come out of the room, and he says he doesn't look like Jekyll. It says he had, like, a mask upon his face and, like, runs away from Poole. And Utterson says, okay, well, I mean, it could be Dr. Jekyll, but that, you know, he is suffering from some sort of illness that is really affecting him, and so he is covering up his face so that way people can't see um, what the sickness is doing to him. So Utterson says that, that basically explains this away. It's not a very good explanation, but it kind of explains what's been happening. Sir, said the butler, turning to a, short, a sort of Malta Haller, that thing was not my master, and there's the truth. My master, here he looked around him and began to whisper, is a tall, fine build of a man, and this was more of a dwarf. Utterson attempted to protest. Oh, sir, cried Poole, do you think I do not know my master after twenty years? Do you think I do not know where his head comes to in the cabinet door, where I saw him every morning of my life? No, sir, that thing in the mask was never Dr. Jekyll. God knows what it was, but it was never Dr. Jekyll. And it is the belief in my heart that there was murder done. So Poole does not like Utterson's explanation. He's like, no. That was not Dr. Jekyll. The guy that came out of there was way shorter than Dr. Jekyll. Remember, I've worked for Jekyll for 20 years. I know how tall he is, and that thing was way shorter. Poole, replied the lawyer, if you say that, it will become my duty to make certain, much as I desire to spare your master's feelings, much as I am puzzled by this note which seems to prove him to be still be alive, I shall consider it my duty to break in that door. Ah, Mr. Utterson, that's talking, cried the butler. And now comes the second question, resumed Utterson. Who is going to do it? Why, you and me, was the undaunted reply. 
That's very well said, returned the lawyer, and whatever comes of it, I shall make it my business to see you are no loser. So Ederson says, all right, look, like we've done too much talking. We just need to take action now and figure out who it is behind that door. There's an ax in the theater, continued Poole, and you might take the kitchen poker for yourself. The lawyer took that rude but weighty instrument in his hand and balanced it. Do you know, Poole, he said, looking up, that you and I are about to place ourselves in a position of some peril? You may say so, sir, indeed, returned the butler. It is well, then, that we should be frank, said the other. We both think more than we've said. Let us make a clean breast. This masked figure that you saw, did you recognize it? So they start to take up weapons to use to kind of like break down the door and protect themselves from whoever is behind the door. And so they're getting an ax, they're getting like a kitchen poker. It's like one of those fireplace pokers that you use to like help you stir up the fire. And then Utterson turns to Poole and he says, look, like we gotta be honest with each other. We're kind of like dancing around the issue as to who we think is actually behind that door. So Poole replies, well, sir, it went so quick and the creature was so doubled up that I could hardly swear to that was the answer. But if you mean, was it Mr. Hyde? Why, yes, I think it was. You see, it was so much of the same bigness, and it had the same quick light with it, and then who else could have got in by the laboratory door? You have not forgot, sir, that at the time of the murder, he still had the key with him. But that's not all. I don't know, Mr. Utterson, if you've ever met this Mr. Hyde? Yes, said the lawyer. I once spoke with him. So Poole thinks that it is Mr. Hyde that is behind the door there. And he says, you know, Mr. Hyde is kind of like the same um, shape and size as this guy behind the door. And don't forget that he did have a key to that other door that led into Jekyll's house. And this is one of the first times we hear mention of a key, but it's not going to be the last mention of a key. And depending on who your teacher is, they might go more into detail about this illusion but um, keys are mentioned several times in the Bible. And so we're thinking about like the symbolic significance of a key. What does it do, right? It can unlock things. It can show us the other side of something. Um, in Isaiah 22, 22, it says, And the key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Uh, Matthew 16, 19, uh, Jesus says to Peter, And I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. A Revelation 118, Jesus says, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Um, so again, we have this idea that keys hold power, and they can reveal things to you. Um, so just be thinking about that as we read along and see keys more. So they're talking about how the person behind the door could potentially be Mr. Hyde. I own I felt something of what you described, said Mr. Utterson. Quite so, sir, returned Poole. Well, when that masked thing, like a monkey, jumped from among the chemicals and whipped into the cabinet and went down my spine like ice. Oh, I know it's not evidence, Mr. Utterson. I'm book learned enough for that. But a man has his feelings, and I give you my Bible word. It was Mr. Hyde. Aye, aye, said the lawyer. My fear is inclined to the same point. Evil, I fear, founded. Evil was sure to come of that connection. I truly, I believe you. I believe poor Harry is killed, and I believe his murderer, for what purpose God alone can tell, is still lurking into his victim's room. Well, let our name be vengeance. Call Bradshaw. The footman came at the summons, very white and nervous. So Utterson and Poole are in agreement. They believe the person behind the door is Hyde and that he has killed Henry Jekyll. And so they are going to break down the door together and they call on the footman Bradshaw to help them. And a footman is just another servant in um, Jekyll's house. Pull yourself together, Bradshaw, said the lawyer. This suspense, I know, is telling upon all of you, but it's now our intention to make an end of it. Pull here and I are going to force our way into the cabinet. If all is well, my shoulders are broad enough to bear the blame. Meanwhile, lest anything should really be amiss or any malefactor seek to escape by the back, you and the boy must go around the corner with a pair of good sticks and take your post at the laboratory door. We give you ten minutes to get to your stations. As Bradshaw left, the lawyer looked at his watch. And now, Poole, let us get to ours, he said, and taking the poker under his arm, led the way into the yard. The scud had banked over the moon, and it was now quite dark. The wind, which only broke in puffs and draughts in that deep well of building, tossed the light of the candle to and fro about their steps until they came into the shelter of the theater, where they sat down silently wait. London hummed solemnly all around. 
but near at hand the stillness was only broken by the sounds of a footfall moving to and fro among the cabinet door. So we'll walk all day, sir, whispered Poole, aye, and the best, better part of the night, only when a new sample comes from the chemist. There's a bit of a break. All oh, it's an ill conscious there's that such an enemy to rest. Ah, oh, sir, there's blood foully shed in every step of it. But hark again a little closer. Put your heart in your ears. Mr. Utterson, and tell me, is that the doctor's foot? The steps fell light, lightly and oddly, with a certain swing, for all they went so slowly. It was different indeed from the heavy, creaking tread of Henry Jekyll. Utterson sighed. Is there never anything else? he asked. Poole nodded. Once, he said. Once I heard it weeping. Weeping? How's that? said the lawyer, conscious of a sudden chill of horror. Weeping like a woman or a lost soul, said the butler. I came away with that upon my heart that I could have wept too. So the, the uh, pool says that this person behind the door is constantly pacing back and forth, back and forth, right? Someone that's worried, right, paces. And Poole says, but it's not Jekyll's footsteps. Um, but someone is constantly pacing, and he says, once I heard it, even like cry. But now the ten minutes drew to an end. Poole disinterred the axe from under a stack of packing straw. The candle was set upon the nearest table to light them to the attack, and they drew near with bated breath to where the patient foot was still going up and down, up and down, in the quiet of the night. Juckle, cried Utterson with a loud voice, I demand to see you. He paused a moment, but there came no reply. I give you fair warning, our suspicions are aroused, and I must and shall see you, he resumed, if not by fair means, then by foul, if not of your consent, than by brute force. Utterson, said the voice, for God's sake, have mercy. Ah, that's not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde's, cried Utterson. Down with the door, Poole. Poole swung the axe over his shoulder. The blow shook the building, and the red bay's door lit against the lock and hinges. A dismal screech of a mere animal terror rang from the cabinet. Up went the axe again, and again the panels crashed and the frame bounded. Four times the blow fell but the wood was tough, and the fittings were of excellent workmanship. It was not until the fifth that the lock burst in sunder and the wreck of the door fell inwards on the carpet. So they recognize the voice behind the door as hides, and they decide they're going to break down the door. Poole gets his ax, and he swings, and he swings, and he swings, and it takes him several tries to finally break down this door. This is not an easy mystery to unravel, and it takes them five times before the ax goes into the door enough to where um, it breaks down. And meanwhile, while the ax is breaking down the door, they hear Mr. Hyde cry out like an animal, which is that imagery that we've seen over and over used to describe him throughout these chapters. The besiegers, appalled by their own riot and the stillness that had succeeded, stood back a little and peered in. There lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamplight, a good fire glowing and chattering on the hearth, the kettle singing its thin strain, a drawer or two open, papers neatly set forth on the business table, and nearer the fire the things laid out for tea. The quietest room, you would have said, and but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London. Right in the midst there lay the body of a man, sorely contorted, still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with a semblance of life, but life was quite gone, and by the crushed file in the hand and the small, the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. So when they break into the room, they find Hyde's body on the ground, and he's wearing like these overly large clothes for himself, and he has taken cyanide. And so self-destroyer means that Hyde has killed himself by taking poison. We've come too late, he said sternly, whether to save or punish. Hyde has gone to his account, and it only remains for us to find the body of your master. The far greater proportion of the building was occupied by the theater, which filled almost the whole ground story and was lighted from above, and by the cabinet which formed an upper story at one end and looked upon the court. A corridor joined the theater to the door on the by street, and with this the cabinet communicated separately by a second flight of stairs. There were besides a few dark closets and a spacious cellar. All these they now thoroughly examined. Each closet needed but a glance, for all were empty, and all, by the dust that fell from their doors, 
had stood long unopened. The cellar indeed was filled with crazy lumber, mostly dating from the times of the surgeon who was Jekyll's predecessor, but even as they opened the door, they were advertised of the uselessness of further search by the fall of that perfect mat of cobwebs, which had for years sealed upon the entrance. Nowhere was there any trace of Henry Jekyll, dead or alive. So they search the whole area, this entire building, and they cannot find the body of Henry Jekyll. Poole stamped on the flags of the corridor. He must be here, he said, hearkening to the sound. Or he may have fled, said Utterson, and he turned to examine the door in the by street. It was locked, and lying nearby on the flags, they found the key already stained with rust. Okay, so remember that. The door does not look like use, observed the lawyer. Use, echoed Poole. Do you not see, sir, it is broken? Much as if a man had stamped on it. So they find this, like, key, this rusted key on the ground, right? So that means it's been there for a while. If you think about something that has rust, it hasn't been used, and it looks like some, someone stamped on it to break it. I continued Utterson, and the fractures, too, are rusty. The two men looked at each other with a scare. This is beyond me, Poole, said the lawyer. Let us go back to the cabinet. They mounted the stair in silence, and still with an occasional awestruck glance at the dead body, proceeded no more thoroughly to examine the contents of the cabinet. At one end, there were traces of chemical work, various measured heaps of some white salt being laid on glass saucers, as though for an experiment in which the unhappy man had been prevented. I might also like to pause here to point out to you that they still have not contacted the police. That is the same drug that I was always bringing him, said Poole, and even as he spoke, the kettle with a startling noise boiled over. This brought them to the fireside, where the easy chair was drawn cozily up, and the tea things stood ready to the sitter's elbow, the very sugar in the cup. There were several books on a shelf, one lay beside the tea things open, and Utterson was amazed to find it a copy of a pious work, for which Jekyll had several times expressed a great esteem, annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. So they have the, they find this like religious book that basically people or someone has written curse words in um, and done some like bad drawings and things like that. And this really surprises Utterson that Jekyll would have something that someone's destroyed like this in his house. Next, in the course of their review of the chamber, the searchers came to the glass into whose depths they looked with an involuntary horror. But it was so turned as to show them nothing but the rosy glow playing on the roof, the fire sparkling in a hundred repetitions along the glazed front of the presses, and their own pale and fearful countenances stooping to look in. So there's also a mirror, but the mirror is like turned up towards the ceiling. This glass has seen some strange things, sir, whispered Poole. And surely none stranger than itself, echoed the lawyer in the same tones. For what a Jekyll! He caught himself up at the word with a start. And then conquering the weakness, what could Jekyll want with it? He said. You may say that, said Poole. Next they turned to the business table. On the desk, among the neat array of papers, a large envelope was uppermost, and bore in the doctor's hand the name of Mr. Utterson. The lawyer unsealed it, and several enclosures fell to the floor. The first was a will, drawn in the same eccentric terms as the one which he had returned six months before, to serve as a testament in case of death, and as a deed of gift in the case of disappearance. But in place of the name of Edward Hyde, the lawyer, with indescribable amazement, read the name of Gabriel John Utterson. He looked at Poole and then back at the paper, and last of all at the dead malefactor stretched upon the carpet. So they continue searching around the room, and they find that upturned mirror, they find like some salt that possibly was the product that Poole had been sent all around town to gather, and they also find an envelope with Utterson's name on it again. And in the envelope is Jekyll's will, but it has changed to where now everything is going to be left to Utterson. And here we also learn Utterson's full name, which is Gabriel John Utterson. Now, again, your teacher might go into more details about this, but Gabriel and John are both allusions to people from the Bible. Um, so obviously there are several characters uh, or people, sorry, uh, named John in the Bible. Uh, several New Testament people, right? You have John the Baptist, the Apostle John, um, and so on and so forth. And then you also have the angel Gabriel. And both of these people right, are bringers, they're messengers of truth, essentially, if you, if you boil it all down. 
Um, they are both revealers or explainers of truth. And so that is a very fitting name for Utterson because his whole task throughout this book has been to reveal the truth, right? What is the truth behind the relationship between Jekyll and Hyde? And so it's a very purposeful name that Stevenson has chosen for Utterson. My head goes round, he said. He has been all these days in possession. He has no cause to like me. He must have raged to see himself displaced, and he has not destroyed this document. He caught up the next paper. It was a brief note in the doctor's hand and dated at the top. Oh, Poole, the lawyer cried. He was alive and here this day. He cannot have been disposed of in so short a space. He must still be alive. He must have fled. And then why fled? And how? And in that case, can we venture to declare this suicide? We must be careful. I foresee that we may yet involve your master in some dire catastrophe. So they also find a letter that is from Jekyll, dated that day. And so they're like, oh my gosh, like Jekyll was here today. Um, is he the one that killed Hyde and then fled? Like, what is, what is happening here? Why don't you read it, sir? Asked Poole. Because I fear, replied the lawyer sol solemnly. God grant I have no cause for it. And with that, he brought the paper to his eyes and read as follows. My dear Utterson, when this shall fall into your hands, I shall have disappeared under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee. But my instinct and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is sure and must be early. Go then, and first read the narrative which Lanyon warned me he was to place in your hands. And if you care to hear more, turn to the confession of your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. There was a third enclosure, asked Utterson. Here, sir, said Poole, and gave into his hands a considerable packet sealed in several places. The lawyer put it in his pocket. I would say nothing of this paper. If your master is fled or is dead, we may at least save his credit. It is now ten. I must go home and read these documents in quiet, but I shall be back before midnight, when we shall send for the police. They went out, locking the door of the theater behind them, and Utterson once more leaving the servants gathered around the fire in this hall, trudged back to his own office to read the two narratives into which this mystery was now to be explained. So in this letter to Utterson, he, uh, Jekyll says, okay, I know that Lanyon gave you a letter when he died. I want you to go home and read the letter that Lanyon gave you. And then if you still want to hear more, okay, read this letter that I have enclosed here in this envelope. And so that is Utterson's plan. He is going to go home. He is going, it's 10 o'clock at night at that point. He is going to read Lanyon's letter and then decide if he wants to read the second letter from Jekyll. And then notice he says, but I shall be back before midnight when we shall send for the police. So they're still not going to send for the police yet. Utterson first wants to find out more facts about the situation before they send for the police. <laughs>